It's Wednesday morning, and it's time for relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm hoping today will be a little less eventful than it was on Monday. That is to say, no basement floods and no ice storms. So I think that we're going to be able to avoid both of those things today. At least uh, it's starting out that way. Um, <laughs> we'll see what else can happen. Usually, when I do relaxing painting, there's some sort of like winter storm shooting through the area. Uh, today, it looks like maybe we're just going to get rain. So, yeah, can't even complain about the weather today. So I'm not sure what we'll talk about. Well, our truncated uh, stream on Monday because of the basement flood. Um, nonetheless was able to finish these guys okay so i was able to wrap that up at the usual time around two o'clock ish so whatever they are druids maybe anyway they uh they're fashionistas and they're blonde and we'll find out if they ever show up in our Dungeons and Dragons campaign what they're supposed to be and whether they're friendly or not. So I'm going to put them aside. These are our dungeon blocks, by the way. Dice and Dungeons is uh, started out streaming a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, which continues to this day. Uh, streams on Sundays at 2 and can be viewed on YouTube and listened to as a podcast. And if you can, uh, very much appreciate it if you listen to a couple of our episodes. We tend to be uh, pretty amusing, I think, if nothing else. And sometimes we get into, uh, you know, life-threatening battles. That hasn't happened in a while, so I'm expecting at any moment something waffle will happen, maybe with some of the figures that I've been painting. You never can tell. Anyway, um, this whole thing started out as a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, and then a 3D printer arrived, and we started getting walls and other features. Um, this is just an example of them um, that were used as a backdrop for the photos of the... Maybe they were cultists, uh, maybe they were druids, maybe they were... Just uh, wandering clothes salespeople. I don't know. Whatever they were, uh, those are finished. I have now done six out of what I thought would be eight, but I think I'm going to do nine. Uh, the next people I'm going to be working on are these who might be ninjas because this one's wearing a mask, but this one doesn't look like a ninja at all, so I don't know. Uh, someone said they might just be bandits. They, we don't know what these are. We'll find out after they're painted and they show up in the stream in our Dungeons & Dragons campaign. The Dungeon Master will no doubt do something, oh, I don't know, um, creative with them. So these have a fair amount of detail. Uh, they're wearing pretty much just leather armor. So I'm going to be doing a bunch of browns. Oh, that's what I didn't do. What I was supposed to have done yesterday was picked out the paint. Now I'm going to have to go kind of like off camera, looking at uh, my paint um, swatches, my color charts to see what I want to do. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward. It's got pants and boots and some sort of little water horn and a scabbard and a mask. Uh, this one is not so straightforward. There's various layers of leather armor and a cape. And as usual, the cape is, you know, printed so that you can't reach it without touching everything else. So I'll be painting the inside of that. Um, after experimenting with different color combinations, you know, very fancy, very fancy. Um, with these guys, I'm going to go with uh, Robin Hood colors. 
I'll just be using browns and greens, I think. And we'll see how that turns out. I have one brown already selected, leather brown, which with a brown wash looks very much like leather. And so, uh, I'll, you know, like this guy's boots. Armor there that looks like leather. And there's all sorts of little details here to be painted, like belt buckles and things. Anyway, um, I don't know. Like with most things, I'll just start putting colors on and see how it goes. And if they don't look good, well, we'll pick different colors. Um, yeah. And then after these two guys are done, there's two more figures in the set of 10. This one, uh, Alexis, our dungeon mistress, wants to paint this one, so I won't be. But if there's time, I may end up painting this one, who looks like some sort of fire mage, because I'm pretty sure that those are flames. Those are flames in its right hand, in their right hand, and a spell book in their left hand. So I may go ahead and, and do this. And, you know, uh, we might do, we might do uh, like orange and yellow and red, or at least orange and red kind of uh, clothing, because this is a fire mage, so why not be fiery, right? I could paint the inside of the cloak a bright red and the outside like a orangish kind of red. It's got a cowl. Give it red hair. Yeah, might have fun with that. I don't know. I'll ask permission. Um, so there's that. So we'll get started on these as soon as I pull some paints out. I mean, just I'm just gonna pull all the, like the greens and the browns, and I'll make some selections from those later. I've got options here. That's a gloss and I can use that. Two dark greens. Don't need that. Just need one. I used this deep green before. That was okay. Three dark greens. Okay. That that's a that's legacy from um, having painted Christmas trees for the holidays way back when. Black green got here I've got red brown and flat earth maybe I'll pull out maybe I should use the flat earth that's been open maybe I'll use a buff buffs always kind of a brown color there we go so there's that um, I might use some black on it not sure and then I'm going to be needing um, some silver color for buckles. Um, I'm going to reach over here and pull some more brick greens out. You should see these. These are really cool. I'm going to show them to you. Okay. These are PLA spools. Yeah. And then Alexis designed these inserts. They come in two parts, and yeah, they're glued together, so you can put them on you know, from either side, and then cement them together. They're the epoxy here, but you can actually use like PVC cement, the kind we use for drain pipes, for those of you who have ever done it. And then uh, it was custom designed to hold the Viejo bottles. Little opening, so. Yeah, they just go in there. And then there are similar ones over there for the Tamiya paints. And so this makes it really convenient to store them. And if I were ever to take the time to put them in in any kind of particular order, as opposed to just slamming them in because I'm lazy about it, it would actually make it really easy to find them as well. But I didn't. 
So anyway, you get to see me rotate this and look for various colors. I'm just picking out browns and greens here because that's what I said I would be doing. Yes. Are you enjoying this? Is this relaxing, watching this rotate? Use that as an accent, this black red. But I'm going to skip all the purples this time. Glossy black, I don't think. Brown. I'm finding this relaxing because I'm not trying to paint little details, but paint. Figure that it's almost small, so small I can hardly see it. I'm kind of liking this. You know, just taking paints out of here. Just to pile up a whole bunch of colors and then procrastinate a little bit longer. back here again so you don't have to watch it rotating. There we go. Green. There's refractive green. Well, the greens are all down here at the bottom. Dark green. Flat green. Well, goblin green. Now, if I can't do a green ensemble with all of those greens, then what can I say? I haven't that in a while. It's a little better than a brown one. Oh, I need... Use. I need this color. Is that one is the closest to not being awful for a skin tone that I found so far? And I put that very carefully away on Monday so that I'd be able to find it again. And you know what happens then, right? Well, what I'm doing here right now, um, what I'm doing right now is um, wasting time, as I often do, because <clears throat> I like to say I'm really good at this, but I'm not. Okay. So I've got a bunch of colors out now, and I'll probably get some more metallics out a little bit later. Um, yeah, so enough of that. I'm going to get my color chart out. This, this is good because I can then see the variety of greens that I have. And it looks like the ones that I'd like to use are these flat green. I'm going to use light green. This one, this is kind of an olive color. This sick green is actually a really good color, but I picked out all the greens. I didn't get, there it is, it was already out, that green. So this one and this one are good. Let's see. The, um... Viejo dark green is not bad. Um, I'm gonna. I'm trying to stay away from the ones that have too much yellow in them. I don't want that. But like the flat green, you know, that's not too bad. 
and this one, a really, really dark refractive green, I might use that for something. These colors, this one just, this is a nice green, but it doesn't, it's too glossy, I think. And it came out really uneven when I put it down. The same thing happened with goblin green. Some of these have a really different texture. Um, so we got cork brown and flat brown. This beastie brown is okay. Red brown and leather brown. Anyway, I've got a lot of browns and greens, so now I've run out of excuses. It's time to start putting paint on things. And I'm going to start by painting their hands and faces. I do that just so I know where they are. And then um, I'm going to sort of paint from the high surfaces down to the low surfaces. Because I find it easier for me to paint up to... Right. To an edge rather than down to it. That is to push the paint up to the boundary area where it's raised. Anyway, we'll give this a stir. How much time have I used up? Almost 20 minutes. That's pretty good. As usual. No, you're not watching paint dry. Thank you, Who. That means I've got five more minutes of uh, not doing anything. Okay, I'm going to do a flip before I start painting because that's yet another thing to do. I call this relaxing painting, Dyson Dungeons. But I just have to admit, personally, that the relaxing part is the part when I'm not painting. When I am painting, and anyway, yeah, I'm trying to use these tiny little brushes to get paint into tiny little spots that I can, at this point, just really have barely see. Um, which one should I? I'm going to do the flesh on both of them. Just the hands and the faces, pretty much. And then... Paint one of these. I'm going to just start with the hard, with one of the hard one here. The difficult one, because there's so much stuff. There's like belts and buttons. And... Capes. And this cape seems to have... Like a... An under cape, and then an over cape. Inside and outside, there's boots, there's leggings, there's different kinds of armor. Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out what to do first. Um, I'm going to do the, the face and the hands. And then... You know that there's, there's this tie around the top. Kind of like a bandana kind of thing on her head. I can't tell right off. That's supposed to be her hair. Doesn't look like it. Could be. Could be her hair. I don't know if you can see it, but under the bandana thing here. Bandana. Under the bandana, there's this thing here, and I'm going to say that that is some of her hair. And I'm going to paint that buff and then do a wash on it later. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's squeeze some, squeeze some paint out. and do a flip, and what we're going to flip is the cap of the bottle from the paint. Three flips, usually. And it's two. Three flips. Oh, 
hope those are satisfactory clips. And this is this is good. I'm starting with this, and I'm not going to be terribly concerned if I get it on the adjacent surfaces because, as I say all the time, we'll be painting over that anyway. So a few months ago, anyway, many months ago, I guess, Nikki and I used to kind of take turns doing this relaxing painting. But now I'm doing the relaxing painting and she's not. The downside of that is that I try to come up with something to say, you know, to talk about something while I'm painting three days a week. have to start um, wow yeah you know when when people design these things they, they make them look realistic they do a really nice job you know printer does a great job of getting the detail but uh, they don't you don't necessarily think about what it's like to actually paint them That's what I can talk about. I'm going to talk about engineering, okay? <laughs> you have many engineers in the family. I'm not one of them. But my brother is, and two brother-in-laws are, wife's brother and my sister's husband. They're all engineers. And what I've learned is that when you get in manufacturing, the engineers all kind of specialize. Okay. There's like this major groups, a couple of major groups are design engineers versus like production engineers. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is that you get these design engineers and either you know they get all excited about what the new materials can do and how you can form them in new ways and things like that or aesthetic things especially in the automobile industry about how things will look about how theoretically something will work like maybe um, a Venturi passage in a you know just a hole in, where liquid or, or hydraulic fluid is flowing okay so these passageways these openings where hydraulic fluid is flowing they say well if we make it this diameter then, then we'll be able to use less hydraulic fluid to get the same effect. And this, this diameter turns out to be really tiny, right? Like, usually it's in metrics, but I'll just say a sixteenth of an inch. Quite small. And the engine, design engineers get all excited about this because it hasn't been done before and it's like a really cool thing and they're they're talking to their uh, procurement people about how it's going to save 15 percent on hydraulic fluid and they get all excited and they talk to their ongoing maintenance people who talk to their customers about how they'll be able to sell this thing for like Oh, I don't know, 85 cents less than the $30,000 that they were charging before for whatever it was, this big piece of hydraulic equipment. Anyway, yeah, so these design engineers get all excited about this 
putting these 1 16th inch diameter passageways for the hydraulic fluid in. And then they turn it over to the manufacturing engineers and the manufacturing engineers go, you realize, of course, that these 1 16th inch diameter holes um, need to go into hardened steel. Design engineers go, yes, yeah, so is that a problem? And the manufacturing engineers go, well, yeah, kind of, because those holes have to be drilled. And you want me to drill like this four inch deep hole through hardened steel. And it's 1 16th of an inch. And, you know, do you know of any five inch long high speed steel drill bits? Um, and and where you can get those and they go well, I don't know we just design things we don't we don't worry about stuff like that and so the manufacturing engineers go can't you you know can you go back and make these a little bit bigger you know at least 330 seconds we can get that you know design engineers say nope the design phase is already done But now the manufacturing engineers have to go to the procurement people and they say, um, well, you know, what we're going to need is like a couple thousand of uh, 1 16th inch in diameter, 5 inch long drill bits that can drill through hardened steel. Well, by the time they find somebody who can even be, supply them because they have to be, you know, they're not readily available on the market because that's not something that is procured. You've now spent, oh, I don't know, probably the better part of a month. And it turns out that these drill bits are going to cost so much that it's now twice as much just for the drill bits as it was to um, the savings in hydraulic fluid. But of course, they've already promised the customers the savings, and so that cost can't be passed on. And the accountants up in, you know, oh yeah, the salespeople are all upset now because now you're telling them that this thing's going to cost more and they go, they say, no way. Nope. We already told people there's going to be all this terrific savings because of this little design that we put together. Okay. So, you know, the salespeople push back and then the accountants all get upset because they're looking at increased costs that can't be passed along instead of the savings that could be passed along and the profit margins are squeezed. So that's upsetting. And then they blame the manufacturing engineers, of course, because the design engineers said we're going to save like 15%, right? That's on record. The design engineers said we're going to produce savings. And now the manufacturing engineers are saying, no, we're going to increase costs. And so who gets blamed, right? So that happens. And then, um, so you get these drill bits and you finally get them and and they're, they're fine because your supplier is a good, reliable supplier and they put them all together and then you start drilling these holes in the high speed steel. Well, you know, what happens is when I, my big chat window wasn't there. Um, why not? Right. Okay, yeah, tense and stressful painting. No. We didn't try it. I mean, you can say that, but the reality is we didn't actually try tense and stressful painting. It isn't something we did. So I don't want to mishmash too many colors on here, okay? 
So I'm going to uh, make a judgment call and say that this bandana on top of her head is going to be the same color as the inside of the cloak. So I'm going to pick a color, one of the greens, okay, and then paint the inside of the cloak, which is going to be a little bit of a chore, and the bandana, that color. And I'm picking the inside of the cloak because the bandana kind of touches the, well, no, I'm changing my mind. I'm looking at this again because the, the cloak actually has kind of like a cowl around it. Okay. So this little knot on the back of the bandana comes down and I thought it was touching this. And if this was the same color, you couldn't see it, but there's a, this intermediate color in between here of the, the hood. So I think I can paint the bandana in the back of the cloak the same color. And then I can do some sort of contrasting color on the inside. Maybe I'm going to use the really dark refractive green on the inside of the cloak. And then I want to use, since you can see the, the bandana and the cloak, this is leather. So there's a fair amount of leather here. Just the skirt is going to be green. So it'll be a fair amount of brown here. I can use the refractive green. It's very dark on the inside. But on the outside, yeah. I'm really tempted to use the light green. I've got a green wash because I like to wash the cloaks because it, you pick up the folds and stuff. I'm going to try the light green with a green wash on it. It's the same green wash that we've used on the sewer tiles. Not that we're putting sewer on her head, um, but it, it will darken it so it won't look so bright. Stop green. Here's the light green. Okay. Um, so I'm going to paint the inside of the cloak first, just to kind of get that out of the way. Okay. And then I'm going to paint the... bandana and the outside of the cloak, the light green, and I'm going to use the sick green, which isn't really sick, it's kind of a nice color, for the hood, just as a contrast. So I'm going to get those colors in, and then I'm going to paint the leather armor leather brown, with a brown wash to make it look like leather. It looks like the armor comes down to maybe about there, and then there's like this little sock kind of thing here. It's just layered. Um, I'm going to do it all leather brown and use a brown wash on it. And the same thing here and here. The boots. You know, the leather armor goes right down to the boots. I'll make those a darker brown. And then I'm going to use green on the, the skirt of the armor. Yeah, I'm not sure what color I'll make those. One of the green colors. Maybe dark green. That's where this, this dark green color that might look okay. So again, I, I want to avoid having too many colors. But at the same time, there's a lot of different parts of the armor that call for different colors. So we'll just put some on, see what happens. So I'm going to use the refractive green, which is a very dark color. Yep, I need to get this large print chat. Extreme painting. I like the way you spell it at the end. Yes, that's that's what it would be. Should we try that? Should we call Friday's extreme painting? No, we'll take that up with the, the hours of Dyson Dungeons and see. This particular green hasn't been used other than on the color chart. So I'm going to give it a long stir. 
you know, since there we go, it's, it's important as it slows down to uh, get it to shake. You have to shake the table. This is very, very dark green. Which is okay because it's the inside of the cloak and it's, you really just want that to be dark. It's in the shadows anyway. And then you can get a contrast with the, um, with the brown of the leather armor. That's what I'm saying anyway. My story and I'm sticking with it anyway yeah so manufacturing so the manufacturing engineers are already getting it taking it on the chin from accounting because they've just added cost to this thing that the design engineers promised would save money right but the, you know they're not the ones who decided to drill a hole for which no drill bits existed but it doesn't matter you know each department is separate and so one department gets c c the credit and kudos and oh you're so innovative and wonderful and thank you and the other department gets slammed because of reality so that's fair right anyway so they finally get their drill bits. There isn't any more drama about that. We'll just skip that part of the story and say that the supplier was able to create these drill bits and they're good drill bits. Okay, they, they cut through the metal pretty well. But as we all know, when, when you're drilling something, you create friction. And when friction happens, you get heat and when you heat metal, it expands, okay? So these design engineers not only said we want 1 16th inch holes that are impossibly deep in metal that's practically impossible to drill in anyway, much less with these tiny little drill bits. Um, there's just no room for variation. The tolerances have to be down to the thousands of an inch. Well, okay. As metal expands and contracts, the the drill bit expands and contracts at a different rate than the metal it's drilling. So that's a complication. Okay. You have to control for that so that the drill bit doesn't bind in the metal especially since you're drilling a tiny little hole long distance you don't want any wobbling because then you'll get a like an oval hole instead of a round hole so that's next to impossible but because the tolerances are so small you also have to deal with the fact that as you're drilling, the metal expands and it expands differently at the start of the drilling than at the end of the drilling. But actually worse than that is that when the metal cools, it contracts. So that the size of the hole that you drill while you're drilling it is going to be different than while you're drilling it. If I'm thinking this through correctly, it's actually counterintuitive. Okay, the drill expands and the metal expands. And so the drill wants to get bigger 
the metal you're drilling wants to expand into the hole that you're drilling. So you've got all sorts of lubrication and cooling going on. Or you might be like cooling the drill bit, but heating the metal or something, you know, to balance them out. But when you're done and the metal, the metal cools, the metal is going to contract. And so the hole is going to get bigger than when you drilled it when it was hot. So we'll go back to ordering the drill bits. So the manufacturing engineers have to consult with all sorts of other people like thermodynamic engineers and metallurgists and do computer simulations and everything else to try to figure out not only how you can get the hole drilled because the drill is trying to get bigger and the hole is trying to get smaller as you're drilling it. So what do you need to be heating and cooling while you're doing that so that the drill bit doesn't bind and break? Okay. What you also need to calculate with great precision um, how much the metal that into which you are drilling is going to contract as it cools so that the hole you end up with is the size that the design engineers have determined is absolutely essential for this thing to work. Just looking at this, and the, the, the inside of the cloak is, is the dark color. And so there's this little bit of a rim around the arm that's inside, not outside. won't show very much, but I want to make sure it's painted. Anyway, yeah, absolutely huge amounts of calculation and, you know, not to mention the cost and the difficulty that they're going to be facing actually doing the um, heating and cooling of the various metals so that the hole stays the same diameter all the way through as you're drilling it because well maybe you don't even want that okay because if the temperature you have to keep the temperature variation the same the entire distance of the drilling so that when the metal cools and contracts it contracts to the yeah this is why you keep rotating it even after you clean the brush because then you find the spot that wasn't painted. Yeah, so you can imagine that. And of course, at that point then, you know, the, the accountants are getting all upset because now another department, the, the metallurgy department, has hired consultants and they've done their own studies and now they've ordered special equipment and jigs heated and cooling jigs to make this thing work and so that's added cost to it as well and, uh, and the design engineers are going yeah well we saved you money so don't look at us sounds like a diatribe against design engineers doesn't it well maybe maybe at least in this particular case which is actually just an embellishment of something that really happened my brother's factory. So yeah, so eventually, you know, for only 85 cents more, having saved 15 cents, they're able to drill these holes so that they can manufacture this impossibly, I mean, beautifully designed, but impossible to make piece of hydraulic equipment. Okay, well, this is this was good to do this because now I have, I can actually start to see a little better where the edges of the cloak are. Um, I'm going to paint the cowl. 
and okay we're gonna have three shades of green here and those are the three i just want to keep carrying through i don't want more than three light greens going on the outside and i think i said i was going to use sick green on the cowl so let's do that check my charts again anyway yeah so they eventually make this thing and of course by the time they get it out in the field the competitors have put out a new one dark green might work dark green is kind of a nice color but if I'm going to put a wash on it I'm going to use the sick green and so they have to start all over again Again on the next model, right? So this thing's in production for like a year before it's overwhelmed, and half the manufacturing engineers, including the director and stuff, were all fired because they cost them so much extra money. Anyway, what that is is like this, right? The designers did this beautiful thing with a sword hilt, you know and the way the cloak flows and the way things touch and the gaps and things and in between um very realistic lots of detail but then the manufacturing engineers have to figure out how to get the paint in it like back here how you paint that back of that skirt without getting it all over the back of the inside of the cape and you can't and then you have to go back and do the inside of the cape and then you touch the skirt of the armor again and then yeah so there's that that's why i started on this is because this is just beautifully done including the flowing cape separated from the rest of the model with no clearance at all behind here getting the brush into the back of the leg with the back of the cape there um, I think I chose a good color for the inside of the cape because um, it's going to require touching up and this is nice darkly well covering darkly pigmented paint that will cover up spots A break. I'm going to try to get my chat window back. Yeah. But that's the best feature about this uh, relaxing painting with me, right? Is that you get to hear an old man grumble about stuff and tell stories of engineering disasters. So, yeah. So, that's a true story embellished and simplified. Oh, uh, design engineers decided that it'd be great to have these tiny minuscule holes drilled through high density steel, hard steel with drill bits that didn't exist at tolerances that were fine, except that you had to take into account the expansion and contraction of different metals at different times during not only the drilling process, but after it was completed and the metal cooled. You know, and then you had little issues. I mean, some additional issues, like, okay, that's all well and good, but what about the temperature variation you get when the thing is actually operating and the hydraulic fluid is flowing through? Heat up then, if it does, to maintain next to impossible tolerances. This looks like a really bright green compared to the inside of the cloak, and it kind of is. It, it settles down as it dries. It's a little browner, but it's not quite so bright.
We are going to paint the inside of the hood the same as the outside. I'm not going to try to do two layers, two kinds of paint there. Anyway, yeah, what that what that kind of means though is that when you're actually going to be making something, you know, and this mod this model is fine. I can just complain about not being able to get the paint where I want it to, at least not very easily. And eventually, after going back and forth with touch up, it has always worked out with the things I painted. You know, I mean, I can just complain about that. And that's not such a big deal. And we're dealing with, you know, minuscule, really tiny costs in plastic and stuff. It's just you having to hear about it. And that's, you could call that the only real downside to this situation. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to make 10,000 pieces of make and sell, like 10,000 units of a very complex machine. You want to keep your costs so your margins are high, but the costs of the consumer are still reasonable. If you want to do all of that, doing it in an interdisciplinary way, that is to say, get all of you guys together and check each other's work is probably a worthwhile exercise because then you can avoid situations like this one where the design engineers get all excited about saving 15 cents end up costing 85 cents more because what they got all excited about can't be done You know, people don't like meetings very much. But sometimes if they're very focused on what would it take to do this thing that you want to do, somebody spends a little time just kind of investigating that it might be it might have been worth like a 45 minute meeting. And even if people didn't physically meet, they could have looked at each other's work. Manufacturing engineers could have said, well, you know, if you just make this hole half a millimeter larger, which isn't a whole lot, if you could just do that, then we can, then we could pull this off without all of these increased costs. I just broke the sword off. That would have been bad. Anyway, uh, yeah. So, as I continue to complain about how hard it is to paint some of the parts, not all of the parts, but just a few of the parts of of these figures and it, it can lead to a whole monologue about um, the value of inter interdisciplinary consultation and cooperation in the real world okay so that's the color of the cowl you can see that the inside of the of the cape is is really nice and dark it's kind of a kind of a brownish yellowish olivish kind of color um, but you're not going to be seeing that as much as you'll just be seeing a dark background to the rest of the figure i'm painting the cowl here i just want to make even if I'm getting the paint a little bit down onto the surface that's going to be painted next, I want to make sure of that because I don't have to come back and like try to do little dots of paint. Hither and yon. And I think this will show the green wash relatively well.
there's a paint there or a bright spot. Can't tell me. raised edge to the hood around the neck here. Okay, I'm satisfied with that, so we'll leave that. Clean off this brush. And what next? What next? Um... Paint. I don't have to wait for that to dry a little before I do the outside of the cloak and the bandana. I'll paint the hair. Or what I am going to say is hair under the bandana. Next. I'm just going to do this buff color, light color. And then touch it with a little bit of um, smoky ink brown. And it will be a little bit, it'll be like the same color as this wood. But I, th I think, you know, that'll be okay for a hair color. It'll be a tiny bit lighter than that because the base coat will be a little lighter than the red brown that's used than the flat earth that's used for that the buff is a little lighter and a little yellower i think that'll be okay Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, so that's the story about, about engineering. And how people who design things should work alongside and in cooperation with the people who are responsible for making the things that are designed. I imagine, in, you know, in some circumstances, when you're dealing with smaller things, like smaller manufacturing plants, it might even be like you've got three engineers or something, and they all just all work together all the time. Or in some cases, if you're just like starting out, maybe freelancing or something, you might just be the only engineer. And then you you would automatically take all those things into account because you're responsible for all of it. But if you're in a big company, things tend to get kind of siloed. You can run into those kinds of challenges. Like this, in this particular case, you know, the designers, designers aren't the ones who are doing the painting. They're just not. They're, they're designing things and they want them. They want the detail to be really cool like this. Mm -hmm. Be able to see the shouting mouth on the face. Missing a little bit of my particular challenge. It's frequently a challenge, which is to make sure that um, since I'm doing two things here, really, one is I'm painting the model, but I'm also putting on a show about painting the model is that I want the painting of the model to be on screen. I frequently fail at that. 
but so far today that looks like it's on screen you know it's far away i could put the camera closer there very much in my face but that's one of the compromises right here that's the hair there isn't much difference in the color there Like I painted the hair and not the ears, so that's good. These, these tiny little models take the tiniest little bits of paint. It's kind of interesting doing the Fink Weaker Cell go because even though there's a lot of detail on it, the detail was it's much larger. And so I was able to use a brush like this. Okay. Compared to this. I was able to use a brush like this for the fine detail. Now I'm using the Army Painter Psycho kind of. Um, that would have been a stigmatizing name a while ago but I guess just now it's okay to say it's sad I am guessing it's named that because it is so much finer than the super detail and if you if this is the super detail what is that what this is is it's small enough to do a little stuff that I'm doing like belt buckles and whatever um I think I'm going to paint the leather now. I'm going to paint all of the arms, yeah. chest here, arms. This whole thing will just be leather. And when you see the leather brown, it's not going to look very good. But with a, an umber wash, it looks very nice. So I'm going to do that and the legs. And the question here is, it looks like there's some sort of sheathing that goes all the way down to here. And I'm just gonna do the boots a darker brown because they're not the same leather as the armor. So I'll do all of that. And then what I might do then is the, the detail on the, the scabbards and the hilts and the belt and the pouch, okay? And then I'll do the skirt. And the skirt has two layers, but I'm not going to do two colors because we're already we're already up to one, two, three green colors already. I'm going to paint this yet another one because I it won't take the wash the same way. I'm going to paint this the uh, so the deep green maybe. Not that one, it's this one. Use this for the Christmas tree ornaments for our um, holiday special. Okay, I'm going to be putting a whole lot of leather brown on here. Oh, am I making a mistake? Um, yeah, I think actually I am. The, the way this is done is that the outside of the cloak comes up way over the edge of the arm. And it doesn't look like much, but I'll just say this, that painting that in that way is a lot harder for me than painting up to it from the inside. So I lied about what I was going to do next. I'm not. I'm going to be painting the um, 
the light green on the outside of the cloak and the cowl. The, the, the bandana. All of these paints have been sitting around for a good long time, so you'll have to excuse me as I shake them on the shaker for at least 30 seconds, sometimes a little longer. Is having a good time banging around as the table vibrates. Hear what it is. So this is one of those parts of the model that. Um, there's some some edges here along where the hood is that I painted that darker green. Okay, that require a good deal of care. And then um, up here around the top, that requires a good deal of care. And then there's just and the little bit that dangles there. And then there's just a whole lot of area that I can use a larger brush on just to fill in. And I just need to be careful to be horizontal to the surface along here so it doesn't get all over the inside of the cloak. So I'll be using the bitty brush to do the outlining, the edge defining, and then I'll squeeze out a little more paint later and use a larger brush to fill in the larger spaces and you're going to see this is going to be very light kind of a bright green what I'm hoping is that it will take the wash well which is kind of a it's a much darker color so that it would not only show the folds in the coat in the cape duh that it would not only show those well paint way down onto the arm here because there's kind of like an inset there's paint there Paint up to, but not terribly much over the hood. Great, there's this little divot here. Great. There was just something there, an unevenness in the mold, in the print, that in order to get to it, the paint got up on it, so I'll have to pull that green out again and touch up that one spot and I will likely do that early on in the process here I'll have to remember that's there This green isn't going to look, I don't think it's going to look good at all until it's washed. Sometimes the wash on surfaces like this change the appearance very dramatically. And I'm looking for a dramatic change in appearance on this one. the bandana around the top of the head here.
and around the ears and the bits of hair that are showing underneath. Failing edge. This goes down. This is tiny bit that goes down onto the hood. To say again, this really bright green is not the end look that I'm going for. I want these these figures to be a little more rangerish, you know, living in the woods kind of thing. But we've used the uh, the wash the sewer tiles before, and it. Produces a pretty decent color, and it's going to make it look a lot grayer and darker. And I'm hoping what it will also do is bring out the uh, the shadows and folds in the back of the cape. Okay. the blip there, or is that the ear? Now that needs to be green. See, hit it carefully at all the different angles. See how it looks. Top of it with a bigger brush. Okay. Looks like I got it a little bit onto the dark green there. It was hard to see where that was, but right there, there's a spot. So I'll need the dark green out for a couple of little spots. I'll do that after I finish painting the back of the cloak. I'll get to that right away. Because by then, uh, the light green should be dry enough that it won't run. Used thick green for that, didn't I? I should take the colors I'm not using and make them go away. I wonder if it's there's quite a lot of this out. It's got a skin on it, but I think there's probably. I'm just going to take care of this right away. seeing like a spot that didn't get much with the light green. This looks like a little gray spot there. But now I'll get the bigger brush out and finish up the, the light green area. Not good for the brush, but it is. You can use something all the way up to the size that I was using for detail on the pink. So this is dry, as you can see, it tones down a little bit. It is pretty bright. But I wanted a light color, because I want the wash to show. 
that's the compromise. Oh, I see what the issue is here. There's just like this little protrusion, I call it, on the mold. Whereas you paint it this color, it goes up. It just, it's just in like a, I'm just going to leave it. It is what it is. What's happening here? I have no idea where that came from. It's like the the flesh. Either I hit it with a brush when I didn't know, notice, or um, okay, I'll get to that in a bit. Paint band later? I don't know. That's that. Uh, the darker green color right way down in there. I want to paint up to the edge, but not really over it. Parallel to it. As I'm doing that, you can see where the folds are in the... It's such a pleasure to be able to, like, just put paint on a surface like that. Yeah, it's very shiny, but it flattens out nicely. You can see little bits where it's drying. Um, I don't want it shiny, of course. I'd use a gloss paint if I did. Okay, the edge, that, that edge came out pretty well. That edge came out pretty well. So that worked. Okay, um, I'm going to let that dry while well, I fix whatever happened up there. to get the green out of the brush and I guess I need to use the little brush again I don't know can I push it in is there still there's still enough paint in there maybe it is so weird never happened in there There's a spot on the side here that just uses to compromise. Yeah, it looks like I yeah, pretty much fixed that, whatever had happened there. Okay. 
just dry a little bit and make sure that there's that it, everything's covered and what we'll be doing next then I guess is the leather shirt and leather leggings we'll get those done and then I'll just do something about the sash I think I'm going to use the dark green for the skirts, but I think I'm going to just carry through um, this uh, refractive green for the sash here because I want it to show, but I don't want to add yet another color. The scabbards, I'm going to do those in a darker brown, I think. I could do the sash. I could say that's like a leather sash. Um, I could do it as the same color as the boots. I think I could do that. I'll do that in um, in this red brown color. That's a good one. The pouch green. Would the scabbards be green too? No, they might be. They might be done that color. And then the hilts would probably... I'm going to paint those black just so you can see them. With maybe a little bit of, like, brass here and here and there. The green that I used, I'll use those for the scabbards. I'm going to just paint those black with brass or steel. I'm just going to use steel. Nothing fancy here. Use the refractive green for the that to match the inside of the cloak, just to carry some of the colors through. And then the pouch. I don't know, I'll decide on the pouch. We're doing time-wise, 11.30ish, okay. I can get the, I'm gonna get the leather brown going here. This, this definitely needs a major stirring, even though I started mixing it earlier. It's one of those that's been setting about. And so, hi, thanks for joining in. Yeah, um, is there a moderator on? Who? Is it okay if, uh, Old Brogger posts a link to how they can do a huge amount of minis fast, um, unlike what we're doing here. You a gem? Who? Okay, well, there it is. Yeah, speed painting is not something that's happening on this show. This is old man doing things very slowly, relaxing painting for you. And I definitely need to get my chat screen back on the other one. I tried a couple of things, but I obviously am doing wrong. Because I have these trifocals, as I keep saying, those of you who have heard before, Um, there's only this small part down at the bottom of the lenses that allow me to see close up in focus, but I'm terribly nearsighted. And so, um, I cannot read the chat screen that I'm looking at here. So I get a blown up version, a large print version, my old eyes. 
on another monitor, but that hasn't been working. Wow, three videos, you are being very prolific. I'm working on one, um, slowly, but hopefully, you know, that's the whole point, is to chat about um, the battles between design and manufacturing engineers and how important it is to do interdisciplinary work when you're making complex things. Okay, so I'm going to be painting the, the shirt and the arms and most of the legs. Just It's called leather brown. You'll see when it dries that it is not very leathery at all. But we've discovered that if you put an umber wash on it, which works a little better than the brown, not too much different, but enough to notice that when you put the wash on it, it really, really looks like leather. It works really well. So the color itself isn't, but the color modified with a wash is. It's kind of a yellowish brown. This is where this goes all the way around up to where the cape is, but I can't really reach it, so I'm going to just rotate the, the figure here, kind of in a way that, okay, would anybody would anybody see this or not? And if it's not readily visible to an audience, either someone watching a stream or someone even just playing a table game using this figure, I'm not going to make an effort to do the next to impossible. If there are any family members watching this, families or friends, what you need to do is remind me not streaming because I can't do anything about it then. Remind me to sometime see if I can get magnifying glasses. It just give me like 2x or even 2 or 3x just so that I can see a little better when I'm doing this kind of thing. When I was painting Warhammer figures ages ago, I actually got this really cool thing. It's a circle light with a magnifying lens in the center of it. It's a very big magnifying glass, basically, with a ring light, a fluorescent light. But we couldn't use it for the stream because that's all you could see. It just covered the entire area. So. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, you do have, yeah. See? Magnifying glasses. Definitely something I need to get. There's a couple of things that I keep saying. You know, it's like, say you're driving your car in the rain and you say, I really need new wiper blades. But it's raining and you're going somewhere and you're trying to do something, right? So you're busy and you, and you accomplish your task. And then it stops raining and you get home and you, the last thing you want to do is go out again to an auto supply parts store or something. And so you forget about it. And then um, you're out driving and it starts raining again and you go, I really need wiper blades. And just you keep doing that over and over and over again. Remembering at the most inconvenient time when you can't do anything about it, something that you really very much need, but then you don't put it on your to-do list and it just doesn't get done.
And that's kind of what's happening here with uh, the magnifying glasses is the only time I remember it is when I'm doing this. And when I'm doing this, I can't order them or look for them. And then when I'm done doing this, I start doing something else, you know, like keeping the house in one piece, that kind of thing. Or trying to remember wiper blades, which is something I actually do need to get. Yeah, so it just keeps going around like that. So I'm going to keep putting glasses on and off to see what you are saying. Ah, okay. Okay, right. So did you, do you have goggles you wear over corrective lenses or you just had magnifying goggles, magnifying glasses that you, that you use? I've had multiple comments about how nice those things are and how it helps people who have vision that's even better than mine, which is almost everybody. Yeah, see that color is already not too bad, but when it's brown washed, it looks really good. At this point, I'm starting to get used to uh, about the only good thing right now about eyes getting older is because I'm nearsighted. I can see things close up is that Generally, as you get older, you become more and more farsighted, which is why you see, you know, the cartoonish kind of thing. And when people are reading, they're holding it out as far as they can because they can't see close up. Is that my distance vision has actually improved a tiny bit. So I can see things that are more than like three feet away now. I can probably see things all the way out to, uh, no, obviously not. I can't read the screen, which is about two and a half feet away from me. Now, one bad thing maybe about getting magnifying glasses is since my hand is fairly steady considering how long it's been around, um, Yes, I'd be able to see more detail than I can actually produce, but we'll, we'll find out. Okay. It actually seems to be okay. You can see the hilt of the, you can start to see the sword and the dagger at least now. Oh, okay. Um, I'll have to follow that link and find them. So there's a goggles that you put on over your glasses. That sounds pretty cool. Are they comfortable? I hope so. They're at least comfortable enough, right? Yeah, I mean, anything at this point that would help me. Um...
me see what I'm painting a little bit better. Oh, am I going to do anything underneath here? I probably should. That's, um, I'm just going to use the, try to get the, the color, the skirt color in there. You can, if you lift it up and look underneath, you can just see a little bit of it. If you look at it from any normal angle, you can't. So, you know, make a decision there. Let's see, this goes down to the top of whatever shoes these are. So I'm going to leave the shoes unpainted, largely to remember, help me remember that they need to be a different color. Otherwise, I'd uh, get to the point where I'd say, oh, look, I'm done. And then I sort of remember that the shoes need to be painted. soon as I paint this leg, I will look up back up on the chat screen and see what advice you were able to give me. Okay, so this orangey brown kind of color is going to look like brown leather. Take my word for it, it will actually happen. Now, this figure is actually coming along, it's coming along. I'll probably finish it well before the end of the stream today, and I'll get to get started on this guy who's recklessly charging forward with just recklessly charging forward for a reason. I don't know. Not sure why. Probably make an effort to keep maybe the same sort of color grouping. You know, the four different greens and the, maybe the three different browns. Like use the same color on uh, the light. Green, maybe on the bandana. Anyway, yeah, same sort of same sort of thing. I'm not using flat green. I'm not using deep green. I keep the. I'm not using that. Getting things away so I don't get confused by them. All right. So what I'm going to do next is get out the sick green again, which is the color I used for the, the hood. And I'm going to use that on the scabbards. Still haven't decided what to do with the pouch and the sash yet. I did decide I'm going to use the dark green on the skirt, though. So this is just, this is going to be a dark green on the scabbards against yet a darker green on the skirt. But four greens is enough greens, different green colors for this. So then the sash will either be this kind of olivish green that I used for the inside of the cape, or it will be a shade of brown. Well, let's see what else. Ah, okay. Have a good dinner. And uh, thanks for joining in again. Tell your friends and, and family to become subscribers and view us on Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons. Thank you.
that's one of the uh, viewers in chat there who is Danish. And so it's dinner time there. Whereas here, it isn't quite lunch. So all I'm trying to do here is limit myself to four green colors. Actually, I'm just only going to count three of them. This color, the light green, the thick green, and these will get washed. And then a darker green for the skirt. That kind of olive green on the inside of the cloak. Eh, it's just it's it's just there to provide contrast, really. And I think it's doing that just fine. So I'm going to paint the scabbards on the sword and the dagger. And then the hilts. Then I might have to come back a little bit. I want to do the hilts I'm just going to do in um, probably like black, just so that when I do the little metallic bits on the pommel and the sh and that. And I don't want to make it too fancy. There's a little rim on the scabbard for the dagger there that could be metallic, but no, I'm just I'm just not going to. So and then there's a sword blade. I might do that sooner than later. Yeah, let's get on with this. It could be real tempting at this point to just start adding way too many different colors. I was thinking, you know, rather than just making these black or leather, yeah, that this figure might go through the trouble of getting like a dyed or painted leather for their scabbards. like their one decorative feature. I think I think it's okay to do that. And I got a little spot there that I need to touch up with that uh, very dark green a little later. If I paint this, that color, as opposed to a brown, I'll do it then otherwise. Uh, sooner than later. And then I can uh, wash the scabbard just like the, uh, like the other greens that I do just to keep the color kind of consistent. We'll see how it looks when it dries. I might, I might leave it that color without a wash especially after I see how it contrasts with the skirt color. Okay, I'm going to do little bits of stuff here now. I'm going to I'm going to paint the hilt, the, not the hilt, uh, the, um, the handles. It's just these little bits here, okay? And then I'm going to do the metallic parts there and there. Pommels. And I'm just going to do those in a dark metallic color. Again, there's nothing fancy about this, so I doubt that that would be brass. Okay, it'll just be a dark metal. I'm going to use, um, if I can find it, the I'd like to use the steel 
color, but that would run too much. So I have this paint called gunmetal. I'm going to use that, but I'm just going to use a little bit of black, I think, on the... Yeah, just going to use flat black on the hilts of the swords and the dagger. Look at the contrast. I hope the black isn't, there won't be much of it. It's there basically just so you can see it. Hoping it's not just too dark for it. You know, I'm not going to use black. I'm going to use a dark gray color. Um, the black would the black would just be too dark. A little bit impatient here. That may happen. First, it's I'm going to just say that a little bit of the handle of the sword. Okay. As I'm doing this, I'm going, what the hell? What am I thinking? Um, I'm definitely not going to be painting the hilt of the sword in the scabbard because the sword's in, in their hand. Right? So what's going on here? To look at that again much more carefully. I mean, the, the dagger, there's the dagger. But this is, this is all just scabbard all the way up to the top there. So that just needs, that all needs to be painted the green. That was uh, that was kind of a silly mistake, wasn't it? It's, you can't have one. Well, you can. I mean, I suppose in the highly probabilistic universe in which we live, it's theoretically possible that you could have a same sword in two places at once. I mean, that could happen, but. It's not going to happen here. Nope. So I'm going to finish painting the hilt of the dagger because that is in the scabbard. And I'm glad I picked the gray rather than the black because I wanted it kind of dark and neutral, but the black would have just been way too dark. And then um, I'm going to go back to that green, green. finish painting the sword scabbard yeah it was like oh i'm painting the sword scabbard and i paint the handle and the hilt and it's like wait a second the sword's over there it's definitely not here paint this all the way to the top there cheat and paint it there and there's you know there could be some places here like around the top it should just be like a metal rim or a little metal reinforcement there and i've been avoiding that but i'm going to go ahead and, and do that i'm going to paint this in when i get the gun metal
that be a different color. I'm going to paint this a little brighter. Yeah, I'll, I'll paint that the chain mail, that, that, and then the, the whole sword. And I'm going to use the gun metal here and here and there. Just because looking at this, it really needs, it needs that tiny little bit of embellishment. Is it's too large a surface that it has some color on it? Uh, let's see, is there any of this left? This is that. Is this one spot here I need to touch? Probably not going to work if there's no paint on the brush. Let's see if I can just get a tiny dot of it off the top of this. Okay. Um. I have the chainmail silver out, and I don't have the gun metal. I'm going to do, paint the chainmail silver bits because it's here, and then at, during break I'll find the gun metal, which I have out frequently, but not today, that I carefully put away somewhere. But I'm not sure where, so I will find it. Using the black, I'm getting the paints I've used or going to use. Whoa. That's about a million times more than I need. I'm going to paint the, uh, use this color for it, not just the little bits like the pommel of the dagger and the little cross brace here. And I'm going to use it on the blade of the sword as well. Pretty decent not exceptionally bright color. And if I need to, I can get out a little bit of like dark gray wash um, just to tone down the blade some. That's something that's done, that we've done. If it just if it just looks too new and shiny, just get a tiny bit of dark gray wash and run it on the on the blade of the sword. Not so it looks dirty, but that it doesn't look too shiny. And I think I'll probably end up doing that because this is it's just going to look like this is a sword that's never been used. And that's likely not true. Okay, so that's not too bad. I got a little bit up here on the hilt. I'm going to touch the 
gray paint again and just do that dot. It was always bothering me to just to see them there and then not not take care of them right away. So in looking at this, it's definitely, it definitely look better if I put some sort of metallic color here and there on the scabbards that, that will make a difference. And so I'm definitely going to do that. What I need to decide yet is um, I need to pick a color for the shoes. And I said I was going to do red brown, but I've been using that for the base on all of these and they won't show. So I'm going to use a, a much darker color. I'm going to use a much darker brown for the shoes so that they'll, they'll you'll, you'll be able to see them against the, the base. I've already picked out the color for the skirt. I need to decide what color to paint the pouch and the sash. In the pouch, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just do the pouch. In uh, I'm gonna do that in in the red brown I think. I'm thinking about doing the shoes like in flat earth, and no, but that's that's just going to be too light. I want them just to be dark darker color at the bottom. I want to do the pouch in the same color that I do the base. It'll just be a brown, brown color. And then the sash, I am going to do the same color as the inside of the cape. I might just, um, might just go ahead and do that now. Well, no, it's break time. I'll come back and rethink that. Okay, I'm going to do the sash in the same color as the shoes. And I'm going to do the pouch in the flat earth and do a wash on it because I want it, there's a, a nice, like, flap on it. And I want to be able to show that detail, and that'll get lost if I do it in a dark color. So flat earth is actually the same base color that I use on all the wood. And I think I'll do um, I'll do a dark wash on that. I'm not sure I'll use, I probably won't use the, uh, probably use the same umber wash that I'm using on the, on the leather brown. We'll just do that. And the hair, I was going to use the smoky ink to give it kind of a reddish tinge. Just a little bit of fringe of hair that you can't really see very much right now, but it will show better when it's washed. Okay, so this guy's coming along. Um, I need to get the dark brown color out for that. I need to find a gun metal. Uh, to do the metal embellishments on the scabbards. Right, so this is the pouch, dark brown for the sash and the shoes. Belts and shoes should match, right? And I've got the green for the skirt that I'll do next. So I'm going to take a quick break here. Quick for me, meaning long for you. Um... I'll be back before 1230 Eastern time and grab a little bit of lunch maybe and uh, find those colors that I need. So see you in a couple of minutes.
Okay. Um, yeah, I'm back before 1230. Good for me. And I found the colors that I needed. At least I'm pretty sure. I found the gunmetal that I'll be using. Got the little bits of highlights on the scabbards. I found the flat brown that I'm going to be using for the matching belt and shoes. I've got the flat earth, the light color for the pouch, and the dark green that I'm going to be using on the skirt. And after I get those four colors on in the right places, um, I'm going to do three colors of wash. I'm going to use a little bit of dark gray wash on the sword just to tone down the, the shininess a little bit. I'm going to be using umber wash on all the leather, the brown parts here, and the pouch. Okay, not the dark, well, maybe on the dark, but it won't show there. And then I'm going to be four colors of wash. I'm going to be using the smoky ink on the little bits of hair, and then this green wash that I haven't used in a long time on the cloak and the bandana thing. So, wow. Yeah. So I started out saying I'm not going to want to be using very many colors on this because I could just get out of control. And I'm ending up with that on this one little guy. So there it is. And maybe I'll just keep all these colors out because then I can use the same ones on this one. Maybe I can do that. And on all of these other colors that I'm not using, I can put out of the way, sort of, so that I remember not to use them. Yeah, so take off my glasses so I can see. Have a drink of this bubbly. Actually, we got us our make our own sparkling water now. It's kind of nice. Uh, what should I start with? Let me start with. Um, we'll do the pouch first. So I'll do this this color. Yes, some of these haven't been used in a while, so they get they get a good shaking. Yeah, that's that should be good. Well, this is going to look pretty bland, but it takes the wash well. That's what I was going for, is I wanted this to be light enough so that when I put the umber wash on, just like the leather, all this leather brown will actually end up looking like leather. This will be a darker, this will take the wash as well. And what I most interested in is making sure that it's a lighter color so that the the detail of the pouch flap and stuff will show. And this is this is light enough for that to happen. The belt and the shoes will be too dark for the wash to have any effect. But they're pretty minor details and scheme things, so I'm not at all worried about that.
But this, even though it'll have the same color wash as the, the leather armor parts, it's distinct enough in base tone so that it will not look the same. Okay, well, there's that bit. I think what I'll do next is the gunmetal. Just the little highlights on scattered. Doesn't much matter which comes first. You know, it looks like there's some spots there where maybe I rubbed the, the leather paint off. I'm going to have to touch that up before I go too terribly much further. Is there any of this? Maybe underneath here, there's enough left. So right at the top here, there were just some spots. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure quite what happened there but it wasn't covered well. As I'm finishing this up with the last little bits of different colors, before I start the four different colors of wash, we have talked about trying something new. Those of you who had been following this stream either as a stream or on YouTube, know that, what was it, a week or so ago, I unboxed some what are now antique models. They're the, uh, the Renwall, the original Renwall cutaway um, submarine models, the George Washington. Those were the first ones that came out. There were re-releases later. There was an Andrew Jackson that was an update, and the major part of that update, other than just uh, molding it in a slightly different color plastic, a different color gray, gray, is that the hatchway for the Polaris submarine was hinged differently. So that, that justified a whole reissue and renaming of that, but I have the the original George Washington's, which I put together when I was a young teen, one of the original ones. And as I was mentioning during that particular stream, it's hard to find kits that are intact, you know, complete and unbuilt. So I bought a couple that had been started and where the parts had been taken off of the, the trees, usually in a haphazard way and not very carefully. So I bought a couple of those kits, hoping that there would be enough parts to be able to actually complete a one full submarine. And there are. I am very sure of that. And if not, I also bought an Andrew Jackson, which, as I said, was a later reissue, um, where everything is pretty much the same except for the hatch where the, the spring-launched missile, Polaris missile, actually comes out. Um, So some of you watched that, and I hoped it was kind of interesting. It was interesting for me. I hadn't, I opened the boxes when I first bought them, you know, just to see what was there. 
And what I recall was that I was pretty disappointed because they were just a real mess. You know, the parts were off, they were scattered. I couldn't, I could tell that some things looked like they were missing. In a few places, the painting had been started very badly. Another one was partly glued together. I mean, it was that kind of thing. And, uh, but I reopened them on the stream last week. And it looks like there's enough parts within those three kits to be able to put one together. You know, one kit, uh, the hinge is broken off where the fold down hull, half of the hull hinges to the base and the other one is intact, but the base is broken. So together one could make those if the parts can get forced to fit. Anyway, I decided I would really like to finish that model. I would like to do it and do it well. I also discovered that there is a, a whole lot of detail on the model, little dials and toggles and uh, control boards, even, um, even like some stoves with burners and knobs on them and things, just a huge amount of detail that I never paid attention to when I did it as a kid. And apparently anyone who does it now doesn't because the instructions basically say, okay, here's a bulkhead painted green, but the fire extinguisher should be red. But what about all the rest of the stuff, like the door frames or the hatches and the torpedo tubes and things like that? Anyway, um, I thought, you know, I'd really like to do this. I'd like to make this model. So I have permission from the other members of Dyson Dungeons to spend one day a week working on this very stream, because this is, I don't get down here to do things otherwise, because I always find something else to do. Um, on this very stream to spend one day a week, probably Wednesday. So the, the Twitch stream will be on Wednesday and it will be uploaded and show up on YouTube on Fridays. And I'm going to work on the submarine. So there will be Monday and Friday will be Dungeons and Dragons related minifigures and things like that. And Wednesday will be the reclamation and completion at some point in the far distant future of the Renoir visible sub submarine. And after I'm done with this figure, um, I might pull those out just to show you what I'm going to be working on starting next week. So it looks like I'm going to just get this one done. I managed to take a long, I mean, it was just taking the entire stream to finish one minifig. Nikki would probably have three of them done by now, but you get me, not her. So, ha. Huh. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get this one done. And then on Friday, I'll probably finish this one. And then on Monday, I'll probably finish this one. Since I seem to be moving along with such alacrity. And um, next week, Wednesday, I'll be working on the submarine again. Between now and then, up, well, I'm going to do a lot of it right on the stream. Okay, I'm planning to actually, like, root. This will be really boring, but it'll be fun, you know, relaxing for me. Maybe, maybe it'll be fun for you, too, is it's like detective work. I want to be rooting through the boxes since all the, the pieces have been pulled off of their trees. Because I'll be rooting through all the loose pieces, trying to find the pieces that I need for each segment of the sub. Now, I am going to do some things that, you know, weren't originally done. I'm going to, before painting them, prime them, and I'll be doing the priming. I won't be doing that on stream. I'll be doing that off stream, but... I know, for example, I can tell you this, that the first two sections that are to, to be done are the forward torpedo room and the conning tower, the 
not the control room, but the part where the periscopes and snorkels and other things are housed. And when I opened up the kits, what I discovered was that in one kit, the entire torpedo room had been glued together, but not painted. Okay. In the other kit, um, you know, there's one torpedo missing, so we'll have to borrow anyway. But in the other kit, they started painting the torpedoes and, and one of the bulkheads, but it hadn't been assembled. So what I'm going to be doing is instead of immediately pulling apart the head that not painted but but glued, and I don't think they used model cement because some of it comes apart pretty easily. I'm not sure what was used. Um, I'm going to be finding and then reclaiming the painted torpedoes basically by getting myself some steel wool and emery cloth and rubbing off the paint. And when you look at them, this there were a lot of mold marks on this model. So basically some of the torpedoes look like they've got fins with the mold mark seam was so big that um, Okay, what am I doing? Hmm. I was going to paint the skirt this color, wasn't I? Dark green. What color was I going to do? Ah, jeez, how dumb. Yeah, as I'm chatting here, I'm getting it totally wrong. Totally, totally wrong. Um, the, the matching belt and shoes, because your belt and shoes need to match, were to be done in this dark brown color. Because so I was just thinking, yeah, this is a really nice green. I should, yeah, I am going to paint the whole skirt this color. Well, that green has to dry before I can do much of anything, but I can mix this up and at least get the, the shoes started. Anyway, so the submarine will pose some challenges, especially at the very start, because the torpedo room is in the models I have it here. They started painting and that paint needs to be to come off largely and the mold marks need to be trimmed down and sanded smooth. Or they've been glued together, in which case they need to be pulled apart and the the parts that were cemented need to be sand it smooth and I need to find all the parts because either they're glued in which is not helpful or they are in a whole pile of loose parts that I have put into a little baggie so relaxing painting will be primarily watching me get together find and restore the parts that are needed for the forward torpedo room and for the periscope room, the periscope tubes and parts that go up and down. In fact, it's, you know, none of these were really extremely well done in terms of the detail. Some some parts are just absurdly detailed, like one of the couple of the control panels, and other parts, like the uh, periscope tubes, are barely detailed. Um, but it was actually set up so that there's three 
things that go that go up and down and at least three of the six uh, operate. You can grab hold of them and they slide up and down in their little tubes. So we'll see if we can't make that work. So I'm going to be uh, going through two kits and finding all of the parts, setting a priority for the parts that are not yet painted and cleaning, carefully cleaning paint off of the ones that are, and gathering the pieces that I need and preparing them so that I can then begin the, the work of painting them. I do know that the parts For those two rooms are highly detailed. The forward bulkhead of the torpedo room has amazing detail. It's not just the torpedo, the doors for the torpedo tubes themselves, but it, like control surfaces and gauges and stuff that the instructions say, well, paint them green, which I did as a kid. You know, and all that detail just disappeared. But now I am going to be using this little tiny brush a whole lot on a whole lot of the detail of this submarine that I will start doing next Wednesday. So the thing I'll be doing Wednesday, like I said, is I'm going to be finding and preparing and reclaiming the parts that I need for those two rooms, depending on how much time that takes, I might go on to maybe the third. Between then and the next week, I'm going to prime all of those because paint adheres a whole lot better when the surface is prime. So I'm going to be priming all of those and then the following week, I'll be starting to do some very detailed painting of, of those rooms. The other thing I'm going to end up doing with this kit, kits, amalgamation of kits, is I'm going to be painting the hull, which is plastic, gray plastic, shiny plastic, and does not look at all submarine Okay. Um, yeah, that's going to have to dry before I can paint the skirt. But that'll be, that'll be done uh, probably with an airbrush off screen. Off screen anyway. Wait for that brown to dry, which might take a little bit. And what I can do in the meantime is do a little bit of the washing. I'm going to start with the, the most difficult part, the hair. Difficult because there isn't very much of it. And I just want tiny, tiny little bits of wash on it just to change the color and make it look a little streaky. So that's, uh, that's a heads up that starting next week, Wednesday, we'll be working on the submarine, and we'll see how that goes. If people are interested in watching that, it would be great if you let us know in the social media. I mean, if you think that it's fun to watch and you're enjoying it, if you think that it really, you know, you, you would just as soon not, it's important for us to know that too. And then um, we can stop and I can work on that model on my own time 
and we'll go back to doing dungeon tiles and things like that three days a week instead of just two. Anyway, it'll be an experiment, and we're asking for your feedback once that experiment starts about whether that's successful and and I shouldn't. Uh, yep. Got a little bit of wash on the green there. And I got more here because I'm not being careful because why am I not being careful? I don't know. So I get to pull, pull out pull out those two green colors. So the wash worked okay there, but not giving the effect I want on this side. And I got it on places I don't want it. It's too much of it there, not enough somewhere else. Well, that was, this is a thing that's not working that well. This character is going to have much darker hair than originally planned. But well, that can happen. A nice hair color, anyway. So, I'm not going to bother repainting and fixing that. Because it's just, it's one of those things where it is what it is. But I do need to, uh, I do need to fix where I touched spots I didn't want touched. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll do that real quick here. Anyway, after, uh, we're going to give that an experimental try just to see how it goes. If those of you who are, viewers and especially subscribers can let us all know on social media after you see the submarine show either on stream on Wednesday or on YouTube on Friday or later whether you're finding that interesting and you'd like to see more of it or whether you'd like it to go away and not come back either way please let us know so that we can plan accordingly. But between now and Wednesday, I'll be finishing up this one and the other two figures in the series. First attempt at washing went poorly. I would say, yeah, you know, on a 1 to 100 scale, that was about a 4. <laughs> it just it just did not turn out what I was hoping it to do. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of the gray wash out now and do the sword. And we'll see then if the dark brown is dry enough for me to paint the, the armor skirt, the, the green skirt. The last unpainted part here. If it is, then I'll do that next. If not, then I'll do the green wash on the cape and the bandana. I'm just going to hand shake this. I just, I'm using, I'm not even going to get some drops out, I think. This takes them off the tip. And what I'm doing here is just putting a little bit on the sword so that it doesn't look like it's just a tiny bit on the sword. Just to cut down on the shine, give it a little bit. Just 
a bit of shadow and shading there. And that was the whole point of that. Brown doing. Yeah, it seems it seems to be far enough along that I can take this dark green, which is again a nice color, and give it some more shaking. Yeah. And I'll be using a little brush for most of this and then maybe graduate to a slightly larger one. But I need to um, you know, paint up around the belt and the scabbards and then try to get behind here as well as I can. And I might just start in the back and try to get color there. It's just painting up to, but not over. It might have a little glossiness to it. And I think for this part of the model that that's, it's actually going to be okay. Just given what it is and where it is. Holding this right at the top of the head. And I'm hoping that I'm not... Yeah, that I'm not wearing the paint off, so I'm going to give that up. Stop doing that. Okay, yes. And around these bits here. The new sound. Something on the furnace down here is uh, making a sound I hadn't heard before. I'm hoping it's not a bad thing. And I will get a little larger brush to finish this up. With these larger surface areas, this little brush doesn't, doesn't work as well. Like it's sending a Morse code signal. Just be a distress signal. Hmm?
Brush along here to try to avoid. If there's brush marks, I want them to go like longitudinally down here so it looks like part of the fabric. To get a little more paint in there, the scabbard for the dagger is actually separated a little bit from this armored skirt. That in there, and from one angle it looks fine, but from this angle it looks like the paint needs to go just a little bit deeper into that little gap. All right, so except for the deep for the washing. Okay, I've washed the hair as well as that's turned out, and the sword, which looks better now. Um, I've got to do brown washing on all the leather and green washing on all the green. Really an annoying high pitched sound. I don't know if you can hear it or if it's being filtered out or not, but I'm hoping it's being filtered out. So, as we're continuing our relaxing painting, um, just to go over what needs to be done yet, this green, the a little bit of bandana up there in the outside of the cape and the hood are going to be washed with a green wash. And the green wash is kind of a is sort of a grayish green. It's going to tone this brightness down quite a lot. But uh, besides changing the color, which will be okay, is I want it to get into the folds of the cape so that they show like shadows like this one here where this was uh you can see little highlights of the blue but the blue wash was put on there and you can see how it kind of successfully showed the folds so this green wash hasn't been used in forever not since the last time we did a sewer tile i think and the pigments settle way fast i mean they just really separate from the solvent of these washes quickly and significantly there is a spot that is the wrong color just one tiny little spot that no one but me will ever know is there but It's a, a spot that I thought I had covered earlier. There was a little movement to the brush, I guess. I got kind of a light brown color. I think you can even see it. It's down here in the cowl. so tiny and it will dry almost immediately which is good because i want to not wait for the wash very long i have to wait for the brown well maybe i don't actually the um yeah, 
Let's do the brown wash first. This spot. Like there's a, I can't even tell. It looks like it's either. And I think that's just reflection. So I'm using umber wash, which has a slightly different tone than brown wash. And this is what we have used historically, meaning since we very, very first time we use the leather brown, what we've been using on the leather brown, which doesn't much look like leather, I have to say, it's this kind of yellowish brown color. But once it's washed with this umber, it definitely looks like leather. So give that a go. It not only changes the color nicely, but it also, as I keep saying, highlights the, the details. Use, I want it to use a slightly larger brush, even though it's a little bit, tiny little dangerous to do. The little brush doesn't doesn't work as well. I'm getting the wash onto the really dark brown shoes as well. It won't show there, but it'll show the color, but it'll change the kind of reflectivity and detail of it. What we're doing here on the legs is Pretty evenly, but I want to get the um, pieces and ridges. Trying not to have it just blurp up on things. Blurp, that's a scientific, that's a technical painter term. which means stuff got where I didn't want it, where it's pooling up. And not it's the process of pooling up. And I'm going to get it onto this little pouch for the same reason is that there's a detail there that I would like highlighted. From past experience, I know that this wash on this color works well. I have no past experience on whether the green is going to work well on the green. What I do know is that I've had great success with the blue, gray, blue wash on the blue. Okay, that I know. And this guy's got some buttons there. Ah, man. You know, I should paint those... I'm not going to. I just, if I, if I mess up and I get them outside the button at this point, I can't touch it up again. So, those buttons are not going to be highlighted in a different color. So I don't know if you can tell right off because I didn't leave any part of the armor unwashed. But as this is drying. It looks very leathery as opposed to just kind of a yellowish color we had before. And you can see some of the detail in the Stuff. 
Okay, and that tones down the color. It makes it look very leathery now. This this combination works really well. Uh, let's see. So that's good. The, the little satchel here. That looks pretty good. The slight glossiness on the skirt, I think, is okay. And uh, I brushed it when it was just drying, so it actually has some texture to it, which is kind of cool. And now I'm going to do the green. Yeah, this major shaking here. Here we are. I'm going to talk about Dice and Dungeons again. Dice and Dungeons is a group of people who started out doing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, starting in a world that our dungeon mistress Alexis had created years ago. It's a very large, very complicated, huge, comprehensive entire world made up of different cultures some of which uh, do not get along with each other and some of which do. And we said, let's all, let's play in that world. And it's turned out to be really very interesting so far. And as we started, we said, well, you know, let's stream this thing as well. People might enjoy listening to and watching us play because we do. But uh, we actually do, we actually have to say, it's not just like a basement game. It's really quite entertaining. We do, a, I think, a really nice job of keeping it interesting, moving along. Okay, so this green is, yeah, I kind of like that color. Okay, it adds a little bit of yellow to it, but it's not such a bright green anymore. Freaky, but I don't want it uneven. So just to say I want one part of the cloak to have the same kind of tonal quality as the others. Anyway, we started that and our campaign continues. That is streamed live chat, live chat. It's recorded, but it live chat on Sundays at two. Three Sundays a month. So anybody who's like a subscriber here to this relaxing painting who is, you know, likes Dungeons and Dragons, um, is, doesn't know if they like it, but they're kind of curious about it, would really encourage you to check in and either you know, participate during our live chat on Sundays or catch it on YouTube or even as a, a podcast. Because, as Alexis says, you can ear watch it. And you really can. There are no dead spaces where you have no clue what's going on because nobody's saying anything. We're very good about that. Anyway, it's a, it's a good stream, and that's how we all started. And then uh, 3D printing happened. There's three of them behind me. So the 3D printing happened, and that led to multiple dungeon tiles being created. And after year of practice with different printing techniques, redesigns, refinements, painting trials, we've... Uh, Kind of settled in on some and we make really really cool dungeon tiles like these and the best part about them is that in their bases in these little holes there's ball magnets and i always love to demonstrate this that wash dries before i paint the base is that um because they have these ball magnets in them, 
This is after it's covered up. They attach to each other. So you can play on any surface. You don't need a special metallic surface or anything. And you can with you know, you can use clips on these too, but with the magnets, see how easily they come apart and how easily they go back together. You can reconfigure your dungeon in many, many different ways very quickly and very easily. And so these have now been refined, I think, to the point where they are very, very sturdy. They're very, very easy to use. They're actually kind of um, fun to paint, and they're even more fun to use in, the, in a stream. So we have a couple of, we have two, three basic kinds of dungeon tiles. This is the rough stone tile. We have the etching over. I'll just show an example of it. The wood. This, these are really pretty. Stucco walls, wooden floors. All the sets come with operating doors. Yeah. Cool, isn't it? So you'd, if your party is moving along, you run into a situation like that. Okay. You're walking along here and you want to um, go into this next room. You don't know what's there. But instead of just pretending there's a door, there is a door. And you don't have to pretend that you walk through the door. You can actually open the door through and even better you can do things like let's say oh let's say this is you okay and that's you going open sesame because that's how you open the door right is you don't know what's behind it you can go over here open the door toward you and you're hidden behind the door and it, you know you can ambush if anything comes through here you can go poof i use my magic on you right so anyway we've been we started producing these dungeon tiles we're doing them in mass now we're trying to do prototypes of a number of really cool dungeons all of which have uh, little special effects like there's one where there's uh a fire mage and a fire mage just has this cauldron okay which is a nice feature but if you want to start the fire you go flame on that's what we say and you know have a fire anyway cool things like that so there's doors there's counters there's fireplaces there's trap doors there's uh, trap tiles which I'm not going to show you because they're way over there and I can't really reach them. This, this one is now almost done. All I need to do is paint the base. And the base color that I use is um, red-brown. That I've used on the other six, so we might as well just keep that going here. And then I put a brown wash on it as unevenly as possible to give it a sense of texture. Uh, so this is where I use these. Could have been using it all along, but it's just easier to do it by hand. But for this, I need to put it on because I need to get paint around the rim. And I can't, I don't want to hold it by the top anymore now that it's almost completely done. So we're going to put this on the base, um, painting up to, but not over the stuff that's already painted even in the areas that are hard to reach here. 
wait for this to dry, give it a wash, and then this particular one gets to go into the I am done pile. The completion of this one, I will be seven ninths completed. That in terms of a fraction or a decimal. Seven ninths, huh? Yeah, it was easier when it was six ninths because that was two thirds, which is 67. 0.6 to infinity percent. Seven ninths, you know, well, it's more than 70 percent. That'd be seven tenths, and the denominator is smaller, which makes the value of the numerator higher or greater. I guess I should say greater. The percentages. It's just going to be seven ninths done when I'm done with this. Which sounds like I'm pretty close to being done because seven is pretty close to nine. So there. Well, that's good. The shoe color is dark enough that it shows. I was a little bit concerned about it not having enough color contrast. This one will be done. And it only took me a long time. Well, but a half hour of one stream to get one one of these done. I guess that's another way you could look at relaxing his uh, relaxed pace of painting. Base is done. It looks yeah. The the boundary lines look pretty decent. That doesn't take too long to try. So we'll let that dry before I splish brown wash on it. I'm going to keep this paint here to remind me later what color to use for the base. Among the many things I say when I'm doing this relaxing painting is, I oh yeah, I need to remember to do that. Like I needed to remember to get magnifying goggles and I needed to remember to put the paints into the paint racks in a way that they're at least more or less in color families so I can find them more easily than looking through five layers of rotating. I mean, it's very convenient, but when there's a lot of colors, it's sometimes hard to find one you want. Um, another thing I keep reminding myself about is um, I forgot what I was going to remind myself about. Huh, there we go. Talk about getting off on a digression. Anyway, this one, I'm not going to try to paint the face. I just don't have the skill to do that. But there's enough contrast and shadow on it that you can kind of see that this person's shouting and pointing. You know, the finger detail is decent. The color of the leather with the wash really came out nicely. There's a little bit of unevenness in the skirt, which looks okay. The pouch is decent. So I would say that this is a success. And the green wash on the light green turned out okay. So I'll keep that in mind as I do this one. So this one's a little simpler, it looks like, initially at least. There's some details that are tough to work with, the, the buckles, you know, where the inside... The buckle is just the rectangle, and the inside has to be the same as the belt color. That'll be a little bit tricky. Um, I'm thinking I want to keep the colors roughly the same, okay? 
So I'm going to You know, it's really different because this this should be like a leather jerkin kind of thing. But it looks like it's not. A, you know, there's leather on the arms and the legs. And he's got high boots, so I'm going to paint those that darker brown color like this. And this and this are the blue, are the, are the leathers. So I think what I'm going to end up doing with this one is a little different than on this one, which is I'm going to paint the bandana, the light green, like I did here. And I'm going to paint this, the, the shirt, um, this sick green, which doesn't take the wash quite as well, but it, it's, it's a little darker and I think it would look better. And then you know, things like the, the belt and the strap that's holding the scabbard, which I'm going to remember is not holding the sword. Okay. I think I can paint those. I think I can paint those like the same color I painted this pouch. Okay. The flat earth and put a brown wash on them. But they're on the same team, even though they're not quite dressed alike. So I think I'll, I think I can, uh, I'm just going to use the same sort of color combos. It has a collar. So the belts, the belts and the boots, I can do in that dark brown color, like I did the boots here. Belts, I can keep that color going. And I might actually just do those first. Well, definitely would want to do the belts first. <clears throat> I would do the boots later because they paint up to the base of this. But then again, there's nothing to say that I can't. Um, use the same color at different times. What did I say? The light green for the bandana and the mask and keep those co coordinated. And then I'm going to use the sick green for the main shirt. And then, you know, the leather for the leather. I'm going to paint the leather parts first. Those will be the pants and the sleeves. And I'm going to do those. I'm just going to do those now. They, they look like they should they could be okay to be doing now. this point, the only points of contact with another color are right on the wrist. So I'm going to take a chance with this brush that I can do that. I'm going to use this brush to paint the rest of it. Just checking to see how I did on the wrist contact point here. Not too bad. Let's do the other one just to get that out of the way. And then I can paint less carefully. 
pretty good at this point. This is the only place where I can get this color on another color. So if I manage to touch my brush to something other than the hands and the face, which, you know, if I'm going to do something, that's probably where it will be. Red paint, like I'm painting. Get it up onto the sleeve there. looking at is just like with the other figure, sort of a leather under armor. And um, this one just has like a tunic with a collar uh, to decide what to do with the collar, collar color. Everything else is pretty straightforward. I need to decide on a pouch color and a water skin or whatever that is. As I'm painting this, I've watched, I've watched little bits of the videos of this of, as they've been replayed from time to time. Not that I particularly need to relive the experience of painting these things, but what surprises me is that sometimes I feel like I'm moving along real slowly here. You know, I'll look at the video and it's like, zip, 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 zip. So I don't think I was moving that fast, you know. This was posted on YouTube. Did they speed it up? so that, you know, you could get over it, get through it more quickly. Is it really? But yeah. There's a their difference in perception of the speed at which this is happening between the perception I have as I'm doing it here and the way it looks. Screen, that was especially true doing like base coating on the dungeon tiles. You know, where you're spreading a, the same color over and over on the same kinds of tiles, and it's just like uh, forever. And then you look at it later, and it's like zip, zip, and it's done. Zip, zip, and the next one's done. Different perceptions of time you can have. So once again, I mean... I'm going to show the contrast here with the other figure, which is here. This is starting to dry. You can see it on this arm. It is just the difference in color and texture between the, the base coat paint and, and the washed paint. This is really much more yellow than you would maybe like it to be. And then um, yeah, you put the brown on it, and then you can see the the folds and things in the in the leather, and it just takes on a much nicer color. That guy's done, so I'm not going to mess with it any further. Um, what I think I need to do next is actually the the dark brown color for these belts and the boots. And 
I'm going to get it in the buckles and at some point make an effort to paint those buckles. So I know I'm going to use the light green on the, on the bandana and the mask. And I'm going to use the sick green on the shirt. The collar, there's a separate collar here. That needs to be a different color too. And just so as not to create too many colors, but to get some contrast, I'm going to use this dark green that's on the skirt here. It's got a little bit of gloss to it. It's got a nice deep color. And I think just, just for that bit of it, I think that would look pretty good. In fact, um, given the way I'm just looking at which colors butt up against the other colors. Time do I have? Like 20 minutes yet. Good deal of time. I want to put some of uh, those two green colors on up on the head. And then what I'm going to try to do after that is not grab it by the head all the time. But I'm going to paint the mask and the bandana and the collar. Get those done. And I'm going to start with Make that very long, but there it is. And these these two bits are these are things that are in contact with the face and the neck. So getting these done would, would also be good because they're just you know parts parts of the print that are a little bit more demanding. It's the back of the bandana. It's kind of it's a little swirly bit there. As I often do, I'm going to paint down past the bottom of the boundary. Just make sure that the paint is there. This is barely on camera. I need to hold it kind of steady here just because of the nature of this part that's getting painted. It's a really good color, but I think it needs to be thinned a little bit. This bottle was opened before and it might be losing just enough of its solvent now to be a little viscous. Yeah, so the mask and the bandana both come down here and they'll both be the same color. With the green wash though, you can detail in the twisty ties there. With the green wash, I, it will look okay. What I'm trying to do is 
here that the collar here is has a nice even demarcation line at the top. And then it goes down deep enough so that when I paint up to it from the bottom, it will have the color it should have. Maybe just a little bit more there. Here, the back of the collar kind of meets the knot of the bandana. Dark paint in there. Tiny bit uneven, but I can live with that. Good. And it's going to use the light green on the mask and the bandana. That's the same color I used here on the bandana. So, yeah. Just, just to keep it consistent because they are supposed to be working together, even though they're dressed very differently. Destroy the point of this too much by just letting it sit squished against the bottom of the floor. And we'll just keep rotating this. I've got some empty wells yet. Start on the mask. The mask is a little unfriendly because it comes up and around. It's got this edge that's raised. Okay, that's not too bad. I'm just touching where the knot is, so I haven't messed that up. And then um, I need to define the bottom of it. Raised up pretty well. Don't need to get the underside that, that far because you can't see it. So I can just paint up to the edge. To get the top edge of the mask here. Because this does show. comes down right into a knot back here. It needs to be green there. Got a little bit there on the face where I don't want it. So I have to come back and try to touch that up. To this knot line here, and then the top of the bandana comes down pretty far. It's hard to see where the edge is, but I think I can get it by doing the old 
paint up to the edge thing. Yeah, sorry, I got quiet there because I'm trying to get the paint here on the edges of the bandana without getting it onto the face, at least not terribly much. Working around the sword. And these little knots, these are kind of cool. I hope with the wash that they show, because there's a lot of detail right there in the knots on the back of the mask and the bandana. Well, that's where the edge is, but it's like on the top of the mask, the bottom of the bandana, there's a raised edge that we'll see painted on. Okay, so there's that. I'll just finish painting this in here on the top. And then, um, Try not to stick my fingers in it. Comes down, kind of a nice feathery look down here. I want to make sure I capture that. Now look at this, and yeah, except for one, except for one spot, yeah, I've got the green on the skin. It's, it's pretty good. And that's kind of drying quickly, so now let me get it under here. Make sure that that's that nice light green color. I'm going to touch up that little spot on the right, just below its right eye before we wrap up today. that 10 minutes yet so let me do a few other things before that what i can do is do what i've done before what i i'm going to paint the hilt of the sword the handle of the sword the pommel and the blade i'll get those done they did those chainmail silver with a black wash. No, I see. Yeah, that's, that's the strap that goes across. What color did I use for that? Does it matter? Oh, I use this gray, this nice dark gray. Not much of it. do that because it it goes inside the hand here
gives a nice contrast with the hand color. Get it onto the pommel too, because I'm most concerned about the boundary between the handle and the hand and the pommel. It's painted anyway. So there's that nice dark gray color fits into the hand, and then there's a little bit of the handle that shows up here between the hand and the blade. Up to the blade because it's covered with the chainmail silver paint. It's just one of those little irregularities, right? Just raised up enough that I can't paint to it, I have to paint onto it but it's clearly not part of the finger. It disappear like that. That I got on my hand here. So when I pull the flesh color paint out again, I'll touch that up. So I have to say that green looks really kind of, it really is not a very good color um, by itself. I'm going to show you the contrast here. I mean, if for some things, bright green like that would be really fine, but by itself, it really doesn't. But with the green wash on it, you can see the contrast there between that bright green and the green that is washed that shows all the folds and things. And the wash will work on here, especially a little knot and things in the back. I think that'll be good. Um, get the flesh colored paint out. This is the first color I used today. It'll be next to last. Tiniest little bits of it. Maybe not even an entire job. Sometimes this works. There is this nearly invisible little spot where the green got a little too far out. Okay. And then there was the inside, yeah, the inside of the hand here. Just another one of those slight little irregularities. So, I could paint the blade and the hilt. Maybe I'll do that. But actually, I won't. I'm going to say I'm going to start and finish with the same color today. So, I want to wrap up, do a re recap of what has happened today and what will be coming up. Glasses back on so I can see a little bit better. 
at least somewhat in some ways. Get one of these little plastic protector things on this teensy little thing. So what I was able to accomplish today was completing this one. This figure is pointing and yelling about something for a reason. But basically wanted to do it in leather and green. And, you know, there's one, two, three, three four colors of green if you count the inside of the cloak. And a couple, three colors of brown, you know. I don't, I think it, it looks okay. I didn't overdo the colors, right? And the boundaries on the surfaces are pretty good. Washing the leather brown with the umber wash worked like it always does. I'd say, you know, this isn't absolutely perfect, but for use in our campaign, and if you look at it from a little bit of a distance, it's uh, it's pretty decent. And then I started on this one, and I'm trying to use the same sort of set of colors. Okay, so I'm using the light green there, and I'm going to use a sick green on the tunic, the dark brown on the shoes and the belts. The scabbard will be the same. I'm going to paint it uh, the light green. The, the sick green with some metal embellishments on it there and there. I'm not going to wash it, though, like I will wash the tunic. Then I need to get the belt buckles. That'll be a little bit of a challenge, just touching them with, like, a chain mail. Um, I use the same color as I'm going to use on the scabbard. The uh, gunmetal metallic. And I need to do the horn here, the water horn and the pouch. Um, I might do those the same as I did on this other figure. I might just go ahead and use the flat earth. Not, not mess with too many more colors. Okay, so I'll be doing, I'll be using um, the flat earth. And I'll be using the flat brown and the thick green. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's not too much more color to go on here, which is pretty good. And then do a wash. I'll do a wash on the leather like I did before and a wash on the green tunic and mask and head. And so I'll be able to finish this up before break, maybe on Friday. And then get started on this one who appears to be a fire mage. And so the character is holding fire in its hand, reading a spell book. And Now, I'm going to do it in fire colors. I'm going to just go with reds and yellows and oranges. Why not, right? Maybe even do like red hair. Anyway, um, yeah, it's a fire mage, so it might as well be fiery. And we'll see how that turns out. Maybe some like bronze or brass embellishments on the, on the belt buckle and the little... Can, Connectors there, not really buttons, they're almost like buckles on its shirt. So I do have a large number of oranges and yellows and reds to work with, and that's probably what I will do. Once again, you've got one of these things where there's a cape with a cowl around it. Little ears showing, lovely, right? You need to have that just... So that you have to paint around it. These prints came out with great detail on the face, though. I mean, even the even the ears contoured and the fingers and stuff. Anyway, 
Uh, yeah. So thanks for joining Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons. I will be back Friday from 10-ish until 2-ish doing yet more. Finishing one figure and starting, if not completing the other one. And then back on Monday to finish up what I hadn't finished up. And then starting on Wednesday, as I said, I will be doing the very first uh, reclamation of uh, a vintage submarine model. And we'll see how that all goes. So thanks for joining in. Thanks for being a subscriber. Thanks for becoming a subscriber. And continue to uh, let your friends and relatives and neighbors and acquaintances all know about Dice and Dungeons. Thank you.